Okay, hi everyone. Uh, we're here for another week of uh, science and technology Q&A for kids and others. Um, and uh, I have a slightly different setup today, just for a change. Um, and uh, we're going to continue talking about science fiction ideas and what can be real and what can't be and the science and technology behind them. So let's take a look uh, at um, some of the questions that are coming in here. Okay. Oh, here's an interesting question. Um, what will science fiction look like in 20 years and how does the past compare to today? That's an interesting question. So I, first thing I should say is a bit of a disclaimer here. I am, I am, I watch movies. I don't watch television. I don't read science fiction books. So, uh, at least not much. Um, so my, my information on this will be mostly based on talking about movies. Um, let's talk about that a bit. So, you know, there are, uh, and I've even helped with a few movies that have been involved with science fiction and so on. Um, one of the sad things about movies is that uh, the people who make them often don't do their homework terribly well. And it's kind of a weird thing that somebody will spend $50 million on a movie and there'll be a piece of dialogue about science and they won't think to check it with anybody who knows anything about science and it will be completely goofy. But also the movies often have core ideas and it is remarkable how often the core ideas of these movies end up turning into reality. Occasionally, people, when they build technology, actually copy things that were in movies. So for people who've seen like Star Trek, for instance, uh, Star Trek has these communicators that sort of flip open. So early cell phones, there was a great moment when there were these so-called flip phones, people still call them flip phones sometimes, where the thing flipped open. And that was kind of a copy of what had been in the Star Trek television series um, uh, back in the 1960s. Similarly, when, when, uh, uh, when, we were, when we built Wolf Alpha, which was initially primarily a website, and when Steve Jobs kind of uh, put it into Siri and so on, one of the ideas was, let's imitate the Star Trek computer. Let's imitate this computer that appeared on the Star Trek television show and the, and the movies um, that uh, um, uh, where you could like ask it a question by voice and it would start telling you answers. Um, I would say that uh, uh, some of the things, well, a movie that was a big favorite of mine from like 1968 was a movie called 2001, A Space Odyssey that was a movie about uh, discovery of extraterrestrial intelligence and also about uh, space becoming a routine place to hang out, so to speak. And I kind of did an analysis a couple of years ago of what was gotten right in 2001 uh, from 1968 and what was gotten wrong. So for example, they had video phones and their video phones were um, eh, kind of a little bit weird because they looked like pay phones. Some of the younger people watching this probably don't really even necessarily know much about what pay phones are. But there was a, the one difference was the person portrayed showing, using the video phone was doing it from a space station. Um, and, uh, you know, we got the video phones, we didn't get the space station, at least not the, the consumer space station yet. Um, I would say that, that um, uh, you know, I think the most interesting sort of things to explore in science fiction are sort of the interface between uh, humans and what we're like and AIs and what they're like. And I would say that, that there has been, I would say it's still, uh, well, so, so one of the interesting questions actually with science fiction in general is what was predicted and what wasn't? Um, what were things that were kind of, oh, it's kind of obvious this is going to happen. I mean, space travel, it's been kind of obvious for a hundred years that that's sort of gonna happen in some way or another. Uh, video phones, it's been pretty obvious for, since the 1950s that video phones were going to happen some way or another. Um, something like, I was, I was seeing a, a thing recently from 1920, talking about a thing that was called at that time the teledactyl, that was a television meets thing with arms that was intended to be a telemedicine, remote medical diagnosis uh, station, which is finally happening today, but um, uh, maybe even complete with some arms uh, from uh, remote surgery and so on. 
But you know, then there are things like, for instance, I don't know, the prevalence of uh, uh, well, th things like uh, you know, social social media. It's sort of the same as things that have existed in the past, but it wasn't really predicted. It wasn't really, I think, expected in, in sort of the world of, of science fiction. Um, the idea of sort of the web as a place where sort of uh, everything about humans, well, the, the idea that there might be a, a sort of computerized source of knowledge that was right, readily accessible, that was absolutely predicted from, oh, I don't know, Alan Turing talked about it in the 1950s, people, um, a guy called Vannevar Bush talked about it famously in the 1940s, I think. Um, this idea that there would be this sort of uh, place where you could get knowledge from a computer, that was a thing. Now, I remember when I was a kid, there were things that, um, oh, there was the notion that there would be teaching machines where you just um, we sort of would automate the process of teaching everything. Well, that sort of has been tried a bunch of times in a bunch of ways, and it sort of hasn't completely worked out. Um, I would say, uh, uh, I think some of, the, some of the more interesting questions have to do with you know, the role of how much of the world gets run by AIs and how does that work and how do we humans interact with that? I think that it tends to be the case that in science fiction, there's this notion of, uh, you know, the AIs uh, suddenly start running amok and getting the idea that they're kind of like humans and they're going to uh, sort of take over the world with an army type thing. Um, I have a slightly more, uh, I, I would say a softer a view of sort of how the AIs take over, which is, you know, where many of us are used to, you know, when you use the computer, it will often auto suggest, this is a thing you should do next. This is what, how you should end the thing you're typing. Or if you drive a car, there'll be a GPS and the GPS will tell you, turn left, turn right, do this, do that. And most of us kind of figure the computer knows what it's doing. It's usually right. It's usually what we want. We'll just drive the way it says we should drive. And I think that the, um, uh, you know, one model of sort of how the um, uh, how AI in some sense takes over is everything about what we're doing ends up being something where there's sort of an auto suggestion about what um, um, uh, what should be done, and we kind of just sort of say, well, yeah, you know, the AI kind of knows. You know, I've got some little display here that's telling me, oh, stop yakking about this question. There are other good questions to talk about. You should move on to the next one. And I'll just say, yeah, the AI probably knows what it's talking about. I should do that. Um, so I think that's, uh, and, and there are lots of things to explore about how that works and the sort of interface between humans and AIs, which I'm not sure have been have been fully explored. Um, and uh, so, yeah, hard, hard question, actually. There's, a, there's a, a question here about, will there be a golden age for science? Lots of science fiction talks about golden age. You know, what happens in science that I've seen is there are many golden ages. Different fields go through golden ages. So, for example, uh, back when I was a kid, physics was in sort of a golden age. Lots of things were being discovered. Uh, an area like biology, biomedical research was kind of like, well, yeah, people did that, but it's kind of messy. There's not a lot you can figure out. It's not a very systematic area, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, uh, sort of systematic biological research is a big thing. It's much huger than, than something like physics and physics is, 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 well, I'd like to think that some of the things we're doing recently have made physics a bit more exciting again, but hasn't been so exciting for, for a while. Um, and I think, uh, you know, what tends to happen, and it tends to happen is some methodological advance happens, some idea for how to do things. Like, for example, back in the day, uh, a big thing that sort of launched biology was the, the invention of microscopes. Big thing that launched astronomy, invention of telescopes. Um, these, are, these are things that, these are methodologies, these are tools that let one do things one couldn't do before. So once one has a microscope, one can go look at, you know, pond water or all kinds of other things. Under a microscope, you see all sorts of stuff and you ask all sorts of questions, you can get all sorts of new answers and the field takes off. And what tends to happen in my experience, so some of those methodological advances are theoretical things, like there's this new way of doing calculations about something. There's this new idea, like in biology recently, the idea of gene editing is a sort of a, a new idea that launches a bunch of other possibilities. 
uh, or the idea that you could uh, sequence a genome and, get, and find out what the program is on a piece of DNA, that launches a lot of different things. And what tends to happen in my observation is that at every, uh, every time there's a methodological advance that's important in some field of science, that field takes off. And for some period of five, 10, maybe a little bit longer years, it's very exciting and all sorts of things are being discovered. And after all of the low hanging fruit has been picked, so to speak, then it's hard work. And the hard work can go on for 50 years, 100 years. And uh, people often even forget that there was a time when the field was moving quickly and when a lot of new ideas were being introduced. And it, it sort of becomes a, well, we just do this thing the way we do the thing. We've been doing it that way for 50 years or 100 years or whatever. So, so the, you know, I think that one can expect to see a series of golden ages for different fields. Now, I, ha I have to say, there's a very big methodology that is coming in in our times, which is the computational methodology. And, you know, I've often said that for every field X, there either is now or will be a computational X and it will be the future of that field. So a computational archeology, span a computational zoology, whatever else. And that, uh, you know, for, for every area of science, the introduction of the computational paradigm is something that will make all sorts of exciting things happen. And, and for people who are like thinking, oh, I should, uh, you know, what am I going to study or do? You know, computational X is a really worthwhile thing because it is the, you know, computation is this kind of new paradigm that's just in these decades really coming in and it's going to take off in a bunch of different fields. It's taken off in, I don't know, computational biology, uh, bioinformatics sort of took off a number of years ago. Uh, computation as a tool in different fields taking off at different times, but that's a, you know, that's a way to, to see some sort of, uh, you know, those will be golden ages for different fields. I mean, in terms of, you know, people sometimes make the claim. So I, I have friends who make two kinds of claims. One claim is the rate of knowledge is increasing exponentially. We're, we're learning more and more and more. And, you know, there's, it, it's just like, like things are taking off like crazy. And another group of people I know say, it's really terrible. Nothing new is being discovered. It's, it's all, uh, you know, we're only going to, we're, the, the rate of innovation has gone down to nothing. Okay, how can both these groups be right? Well, the reason is that I think that if you look at things like academic papers, the way that, that professors and so on write up their research, uh, the number of those things that get written has been, grad has been increasing very, very dramatically. Now, is there really, uh, and that's partly because of the mechanisms by which people, you know, they, they, it's, it's good if you're a professor, if you publish more papers, that's a good thing. You get a you know, better position, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's like there's a, there's a feedback mechanism to just publish more papers, even if the content per paper may be going down. And so that's, that's so one thing is if you look at you know, how much stuff is published in all these different areas, it's increasing. It's increasing even quite dramatically. Okay, so that makes everything look like, oh, everything's speeding up. Okay, the other thing is like what, New discoveries are being made. Well, if you say, let's pick a field like physics, let's say, or, or even something in computation or technology or whatever else. Once you know the name of the field, once everybody knows the name of the field, probably that golden age is over. And so if you only look at fields where you already knew about them, or where, for example, there's a, there's a grand prize that's being given out for that field, then yes, what will happen is that you won't see a lot of innovation happen because those are fields that were after their major innovative period. Um, and so, so again, so it will look as if not much is happening, but the way you have to look to see really exciting things happening is usually, well, maybe it's an existing field that has some new methodology, or maybe it's a new field, or maybe there's a new methodology that caused people to invent a newly named field. All right, that's a little bit, a little bit of a complicated answer, but, but, um, uh, let's see. Um, gosh, there's a question here about, um, uh, from Mahmoud about, um, 
Russia and the US are only a few miles apart at some locations. So it takes more than 10 hours of flight time. Um, well, it reminds me of something. Okay, this is a silly story, perhaps not, not so amusing for many. When I was a kid, I don't know, five years old or something, some, some pompous adult asks me, uh, this was, remember, in the 1960s, when, if you know history, it was during the Cold War, when there was this big sort of standoff between the US and what was then the Soviet Union, uh, sort of Russia and, and related, well, now related countries, um, the uh, geographically related countries. The, um, uh, so this person asks me, when do you think Russia and the US will join up? So I think for a minute and I say, I don't know, maybe 50,000 years from now. And the person's like, that's crazy. That's a crazy answer. How could, why could you say something like that? And I was like, well, you know, I think there are these tectonic plates that, you know, there's a, there's, I didn't know the details of, of, of how that worked at that time, but you know, there's the North American plate where there's this sort of rigid piece of rock that, that all of North America is on. There's another one that's the Eurasian plate or whatever. And, and they, they gradually move and that's what produces, you know, when, when these plates crash into each other, that's what, you know, wells up to produce mountains, things like that. And um, the, uh, and so, you know, I knew about tectonic plates and I knew there was sort of slow motion of these things. And so the question I was answering was, a question about um, uh, geology. The question the person was asking was a question about geopolitics. Um, and so it was like uh, uh, an interesting example of, of how, how one can have different points of view about things. Um, I, I, um, I have no idea about, uh, I, can, I can say only one thing about, so you know, when you fly between two points on the earth, uh, the question is what is the shortest path between those two points? If you were, if the Earth was flat, we all know the shortest path between two points is just a straight line. Um, the Earth isn't flat; it's a sphere, roughly. Um, bulges a little bit at the equator, but it's roughly a sphere. Um, and the question is, between two points on a sphere, what's the shortest path? Imagine you take a piece of string and you're pulling it on the two ends. Well, the shortest path is what's called a great circle. It's um, it's a it's a it's a it's a piece of a circle that uh, where the center of the circle is the center of the Earth. So between any two points on the Earth, the shortest path is a great circle. Um, and that's, that's just measuring the number of miles you have to go on the surface of the Earth. Now, if you're flying in a plane, there are different issues. So for example, one issue is if you fly, in, the, there is typically winds, prevailing winds on the Earth that uh, circulate um, in one direction, I guess, in the Northern Hemisphere, one direction in the Southern Hemisphere, I believe. Um, I have to think about that moment, but um, that, that's, I think that's right. Is that right? I think so. Um, the, uh, in any case, there are prevailing winds that will typically blow in one direction or another. I mean, the fact that winds blow in a definite direction uh, is relevant. Like when you look at an airport, for example, right? Airports have runways um, and let's say they, they'll, they'll have runways in certain directions. Planes like to take off and land into the wind. Why? Because they want the, the um, even though their wheels are only going along the ground at let's say 100 miles an hour, 120 miles an hour, something like that, they want the airflow over their wings to be as fast as possible. And so the way you achieve that is by having the wind blowing, uh, uh, the headwind blowing uh, onto the plane like that. So the, so the wind might be blowing at let's say 20 miles an hour, maybe 50 miles an hour, the wind is blowing 50 miles an hour, the plane is going at 100 miles an hour. So that means that the, if, the, if the wind is blowing uh, sort of uh, 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 into the direction that the, the, the plane is going, to, from the direction the plane is going into, then that means the speed of the air over the wings will be 100 plus 50 miles an hour, 150 miles an hour. And that's good because the faster the, the, um, the air is, is uh, flowing over the wings, the more lift the plane will be able to get and so on. So, so that it's able to take off more easily without it having to uh, roll its wheels faster on the ground. So, but that only works if the runway for the, the airport is arranged in a direction that makes it be the case that you can, um, uh, that you are, uh, that, that, that the wind tends to be in the direction uh, along the runway. If the, if the wind was always 
across 90 degrees to the runway, that's bad. It's actually kind of hard to land a plane if there's a, if there's a strong wind that's blowing uh, 90 degrees to the runway, you end up having to tip the plane on and land it on one wheel and all sorts of elaborate things um, to, deal with, to deal with that. Um, so anyway, the, the, um, uh, if you kind of look at a map of, of sort of airports on, on the earth, you can kind of see something about the prevailing winds because of the way that airport runways tend to be aligned. And if you, if you look at airport runways, piece of sort of uh, techno trivia, um, they'll have big numbers written at the two ends. Uh, they're usually two digit numbers. So um, uh, there'll be like a, a 2828 written at one end and a 10 written at the other end. Um, and those are the uh, those are the magnetic headings, basically the of the of the runways. And so, if you fly planes, it'll be you know land on runway two eight, which means um, land on the runway which is in a at a, a, at a bearing uh, of of two hundred eighty degrees um, relative to north. And the reason so a runway might be two eight and one zero because going one direction, it's did I get that right? Or did I not get that right? Two, I have to do my, my arithmetic correctly. Um, let's see, they should be 180 degrees apart. Yes, that's right. Um, so on one direction, what, what has to be the case is that landing one way, you're at a heading of 280 degrees. So that's, that's roughly, uh, roughly west. And if you, uh, 270 would be west. Um, and and the, if you're going the other way on the runway, the, the heading would be, uh, uh, let's say if you're going east, it would be 90. So that would be, uh, so then you could have a runway which was, which would um, uh, be um, on one side, it would say 27. On the other side, it would say uh, nine or, or zero nine. Um, and uh, so that's, so if you, if you, if you notice on, on aerial photographs of, of uh, airport runways, you'll see those numbers painted on, which give their, give their um, uh, directions. Okay. That was a very long, ponderous way of saying that even though the shortest path between two points on the Earth is a great circle, if you're flying a plane, you may not want to fly the exact great circle path because if the wind is blowing in a direction and the winds at uh, the altitude planes fly at can be really fast, like 150 miles an hour, 200 miles an hour even, I think. Um, and uh, so it really makes a difference since a plane is flying at maybe 500 miles an hour, 550 miles an hour. It really makes a big difference if you have a headwind that's, that's uh, you know, making you go 200 miles an hour less quickly relative to the ground because relative to the air, the, the speed a plane flies like 550 miles an hour. What the plane pet cares about is how fast the air is flowing over its wings and it has to keep that below uh, something below the speed of sound. Um, and uh, the, uh, among other things, and it, it um, uh, so, so that's what matters for the plane is the airspeed, the speed that the plane is flying relative to the air. What matters as far as when you get to your destination is the ground speed, how fast the plane is flying relative to fixed points on the ground. And so it depends on the wind, uh, what the relationship between those two things is. And so you don't necessarily want to fly in a great circle path if the prevailing wind is in a in a funny direction, you might it might be better for you since the wind is not uniform across the whole Earth. It might be better for you to fly uh, further south for a while, then go up further north because you're avoiding places where the wind is blowing in a direction that will make you go more slowly. So, so that's one reason why why planes don't fly on great circle paths. Um, another reason is um, another reason is another very mundane reason is that they tend to fly from one radio navigation beacon to another. So there'll be these beacons on the ground that um, uh, even though nowadays planes just could know where they are from GPS, from satellites, uh, it's still the case that in most places, planes fly from one radio navigation beacon, the position of one radio navigation beacon on the ground to another one, even though they're probably knowing where they are, not from those radio navigation beacons, but from GPS. And the final reason, of course, why planes don't fly um, in, in great circle paths and so on is because uh, you have to, a country has to say it's okay to fly over our airspace um, or you can't do it. Um, and so it's, uh, it's always complicated what happens in, um, uh, in different places, whether different, I remember uh, when um, years ago, the, um, uh, well, these days, if you fly, I think from, from London, to Tokyo, I think. I think those are at opposite sides of the earth. And that's sort of the question, do you fly, 
uh, over the US or do you fly over Russia? Um, and um, uh, that I think I think it's roughly even, and it depends on the wind, which way it's best better to, for the plane to go. Uh, but in the past, there wasn't any choice because uh, when there was the Soviet Union and so on, uh, they didn't allow planes, at least for a while, they didn't allow planes to fly over their airspace, and so that meant that you had to had to go in a different way. But I'm not sure I was answering the question that was asked here. Um, there's a question here. Why and how do you know all this? Uh, Mark was asking. I don't know what the, this was, but, but um, look, I've, I've spent, uh, I have a decent memory, as you guys might have figured out by the time you've watched a few of these, a um, uh, few of these things, and I, I've been steadily accumulating knowledge all my life, and, and now I'm an old guy, so, so that's how I know stuff. And, and uh, I, I, I did learn at one point to fly planes, so I know a tiny bit about, about that, although I haven't, haven't done, it for, uh, done it for ages. Okay, um, let's see, there's questions about flying saucers. I don't know much about flying saucers. Uh, this question from Brian, do you think we will have brain implants that allow us to access the internet anytime soon? Interesting question. You know, the, uh, so our, our brain, the nerves in our brain, the 100 billion nerve cells in our brain basically work electrically. They're sending signals to each other electrically. And there's sort of a question of, can we read out those electrical signals and find out what's going on in a brain? Or even can we insert electrical signals to change what a nerve cell is thinking, so to speak, in our brains? In terms of, of reading out what our brains uh, kind of are thinking, you know, we can get an EEG electroencephalogram. We can put, you know, electrodes on our heads, like a 12 electrodes on different places on our, on our head. And we can, we can start trying to figure out what electrical activity is going on in our brain. Actually, the EEG signal is very, very poor in the sense that the, uh, by the time each of those 100 billion neurons is sending out a different signal. But by the time we've got a great big, uh, you know, electrode stuck on our head, um, it's, it's, it's reading out the results of, of millions of, or, or more, or even billions of different nerve cells. And by the time the electrical signals have gotten through our skulls and all that kind of thing, it's, it's, they've been really mushed out. So, so it's hard to read from, from outside the, the um, uh, you know, outside one's head, it's hard to read uh, a lot of very fine detail about what the electrical activity in the brain is. What you do see, if you look at EEG, the, um, uh, the main thing you see are these big collective excitations. There's the so-called alpha rhythm of the brain, which is at about nine, nine point eight, nine, nine-ish uh, cycles a second. So about nine times a second, there's a sort of big uh, kind of uh, increase and decrease, increase and decrease of electrical activity in the brain. That's the so-called alpha rhythm. And there are things like when you go to sleep, the theta rhythm, I think, starts up. And that's a different term. Um, uh, that's a different rhythm in the brain. That's sort of a collective phenomenon that's happening in the brain, um, and that's uh, uh, so. Those are those are kind of large scale features of the brain. I don't think it's very clear what the alpha rhythm is due to. I think it's it's some um, uh, the uh, it's sort of a perhaps it's some kind of large scale synchronization, large scale signaling. Doesn't really know, and I think what what it's due to. Uh, the one thing that can happen is uh, if you have uh, if you get various kinds of brain in injuries or if you have epilepsy, uh, the, the, the bad thing that can happen is that um, there can be a kind of large scale uh, sort of um, uh, uh, large scale effect on the brain where the so-called depolarization wave, where, where a whole bunch of neurons collectively together will get excited, get, get, excite decay, excite decay. And so you get these large scale effects which are, which are visible on EEG. EEG is pretty hard to read, actually. Um, and if, if you go, um, you know, if, if you're like trying to figure out uh, why you're not sleeping better and things like this, you might go to a sleep lab. I'm not sure I would be able to sleep if I went to a sleep lab, but, but I'm sure they're very comfortable. Um, but uh, the, um, uh, and they'll hook up EEG to your brain and then watch the, um, uh, the, the, the different waves that develop during different stages of sleep. So, you know, when we sleep, there are, there are different, um, uh, we go through different stages, uh, um, slow wave sleep, REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, um, all sorts of different things. 
and, and even even from a little uh, a little you know fitness watch type accelerometer thing, if you're measuring heart rate and you're measuring motion, you can actually tell to a decent approximation um, how much of those different phases of sleep uh, you you get in a night. Um, so actually, one question uh, we're, we're sort of veering off topic here, but but one question you might ask is why do we sleep? And this is one of those sort of super obvious science questions where we don't completely know the answer yet. And, um, you know, people have said, okay, one of the more bizarre theories of why we sleep is because evolutionarily we evolved to, to keep out of trouble during the night. Okay, that, was a, that has been a fairly serious theory of why there's sleep because not all animals do sleep. And some animals have, have weird features like I think, um, uh, sharks, I think, have this thing where they have two sides of the brain and they can one side can be asleep while the other one is awake. And, um, you know, other kinds of animals, I think, I think by the time you're at, um, uh, uh, by the time you're above insects and things, you do have some kind of phenomenon of sleep for, for most animals. And, uh, but, but there are ones that sleep very little. There are ones like, I don't know, koalas that hang out asleep for, I don't know, 20 something hours per day. And, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of variation in the amount of sleep. So, so the question, why do we sleep? You know, I have always believed that, um, uh, and I, I've, uh, I, I've always thought for, for ages that we probably sleep to somehow rest our brains in the same way that, that if, we, if we, you know, do things with our muscles, when we've, when we've tensed our muscles. So when we, you know, the way muscles work, there are a bunch of these filaments, protein filaments, and whenever the nerves, uh, send electrical signals to our muscles saying tense up that muscle the, 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 those, um, those filaments uh, sort of uh, sort of climb over each other and contract um, and when we do that a bunch of times we build up lactic acid um, and that has to slowly sort of diffuse out and that's that's what um, you know you can kind of massage your muscles to get rid of that um, as a because your muscles sort of get tired and I've always sort of assumed that something like that must be happening in the brain. And people I know in, in uh, neuroscience have, have for years told me, oh, no, 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 it isn't like that. It's something different. So what is it? Well, uh, the one theory has been that sleep is important for the consolidation of memories. Um, and, and by the way, I think the end, res the end answer is sleep is something that biology discovered and then lots of different things get done during sleep. Um, and so it isn't really for one purpose alone in biology. I mean, uh, you know, another question is, do you actually need sleep? And, you know, you can try, uh, you know, you can try and stay awake for a super long time and maybe you'll get to a few days when you're awake and then pretty soon you'll, you'll fall asleep. And if you, if you really stopped yourself from falling asleep, you'd probably in the end die. Um, but not, that's not completely clear that that's true because, but, but, um, uh, it seems to be the case that it's really, you know, if you kept yourself awake for a whole week or something, it would do really bad things to you. So, and th there are other, okay, so, so a theory that was popular in neuroscience was sleep is a time when you consolidate memories. So during the day, we're bringing in all these memories, we're, we're, learnt, we're seeing all these things, and, and the idea was sleep is a time when you sort of organize all those memories for really long-term storage. Possibly, possibly an effect. Uh, you know, there are other things that happen if you, if you get too little sleep. There are lots of bad things if you get too little sleep. But another thing that happens is your immune system doesn't work as well. Why that has to do with sleep, not particularly clear. Okay, so another thing that's known is uh, when uh, there is one thing that's claimed is there's a buildup of a substance called adenosine um, in, in the brain. And I think, you know, one sort of naive point of view is when a nerve cell when there are electrical pulses in nerve cells, they, nerve cells work like little tiny batteries and they use electrochemistry. They use chemical processes to produce an electrical signal. And every time there's a, every time a nerve cell, so, so nerves operate about a thousand times a second, roughly. Um, so that they're, they're, a nerve is kind of doing something maybe a thousand times a second. Um, and so every time it sort of does something, uh, it produces a little electrical pulse like a little little operation of a battery, and it produces there's a um, it uh, sort of a little it produces a neurotransmitter. So like one common one is acetylcholine, um, is a type of neurotransmitter, and and this neurotransmitter there are other ones uh, serotonin, dopamine, things like this. 
are also neurotransmitters. And those are things which are part of the, the, the chemical part of the electrochemistry of transmitting an electrical signal from one nerve cell to another to send to, to sort of signal another nerve cell. So, so one question is whether when you have a lot of those signaling processes happening, are you building up any residue? Does, is there something that is the sort of side effect, just like lactic acid is the side effect in muscles, is there similarly a side effect, an actual chemical that is sort of a side effect in, um, uh, in, in the operation of the brain? And, and probably the answer is yes. And probably my guess might be wrong. Although I think anosine is, is thought to be possibly that, that, that thing, um, that in sleep, one of the things that's happening is the brain is kind of washing out um, that, that sort of uh, that waste material that has been produced as a result of all that thinking you've been doing during the day. Um, and, and, you know, what happens often in sleep is, um, uh, so, uh, for example, in, in, in um, let's see, I have to get my sleep stages right here. Uh, some stages of sleep, you kind of, uh, your muscles are completely limp. And you're uh, in other stages of sleep, you're kind of flailing around, and, and that's why you can detect this stuff with with uh, uh, with an accelerometer. But um, uh, I think the um, uh, you know one of one of the theories is you know sort of better disconnect all the motor functions at a time when your brain is doing weird stuff and cleaning out weird things, because otherwise you'll end up doing something terrible in your sleep, so to speak, and and that's why that that is better disconnected. And you might ask about dreams, for example. Um, I'm a lousy person to ask about dreams because I almost never remember mine, um, possibly because I don't use an alarm clock, but, but that's, um, uh, uh, or very rarely. Um, but uh, so I don't usually wake up in the middle of, 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 of having a, a dream. But, but um, you know, presumably dreams are the result of sort of the completion that our brain does of sort of random signals. A random signal comes in and our brain is kind of trying to make sense of that random signal. And so we build up this whole story around that random signal and that's, and that's how we make up sort of what we, what we have in dreams. Okay, but I think the original question here was about connecting, directly connecting to brains with neural implants and things like this. So, so with purely electrical signals, it's very hard to get precise information from outside the, the head, so to speak. With magnetic signals, it's actually a little bit easier, but you have to be in a very uh, magnetically quiet environment where there are no you know, electrical devices running around it and so on. Um, the alternative is, actually put something in your brain. And uh, you know, for people who have like Parkinson's disease, for example, uh, they might have a deep brain stimulator, which is something that's put into their brain that um, is used to, to help produce an electrical signal that um, uh, will, uh, for example, excite areas of the brain that produce dopamine or whatever else. I'm not, not sure about all the details about how that works. Um, but anyway, that's a, it's a case where one's put something into the brain um, and one's sending signals out. Now, there are various attempts to make, uh, when you do that, nerve cells are pretty small. And so one of the questions is, can you make something that looks like a piece of like a microprocessor chip with little connections on it, where those little connections will all connect to different nerve cells in your brain? And maybe the answer is yes. Nerve cells aren't very keen usually on things like silicon, and so they, it's, it's hard to make that junction work, although I think progress has been made, being made in that. But let's say you have this whole array of, um, uh, of little electrical connections, and you've got nerve cells that are right up against those electrical connections, so that you potentially could, could, uh, uh, could both read out what the nerve cells are doing and send back signals into the nerve cells. That's a conceivable thing to do. It's of most immediate interest to people who have like spinal cord injuries where there are nerves in the spinal cord that are associated with uh, uh, either bringing sensations from, I don't know, some part of their body to their brain or for sending out motor signals saying, you know, move the leg, move this, whatever. And if the spinal cord is injured or, or even severed, then there's the question of, of can you make something that will connect those nerve fibers back up again? It's probably a little bit easier to think about doing that than it is to to really, well, I don't know whether it's easier. It's, it's different from, from the case of the brain, but it's a similar kind of idea. But so then the question is, you've got this, this interface, which has a bunch of, bunch of little electrical connections, got a bunch of nerve cells right up against those electrical connections. Then the question is, okay, what do those electrical connections, those nerve cells, you see that when I lift my hand, some nerve cells 
uh, start producing electrical signals. But you have to learn what those nerve cells are doing. You have to learn which nerve cells specifically are associated with this or that. And you know, in general terms, brains, not all brains are laid out the same way. Um, particularly people like me who are left-handed, their brains get laid out a little differently. Um, and uh, they're often, um, um, so it, it's, um, but, but you know, generally you have the, the general architecture of the brain, you know, the visual cortex, which deals with, with uh, uh, vision from your eyes at the back of your head. It's kind of a piece of bad design because it means the optic nerve has to go all the way through your brain right to the back of your head to, um, to get uh, its signals processed. Um, there's the motor strip, which is somewhere up here, which is responsible for the nerve signals that cause you to be able to move move things, uh, uh, you know, make your muscles move around and so on. But but imagine that you've you've put uh, some you know direct neural connection into some part of your brain. First thing you've got to do is learn what are those nerves in that part of your brain actually doing, and they'll be laid out differently for each person. Uh, maybe the general areas might be similar, but, but the, the details will be different for each person. So, so you know, like one thing I always thought, um, I, I always wondered whether it'd be possible to use EEG to type. So for example, it, you know, the motor strip I mentioned is up here. There's a pre-motor strip. And, and if you measure uh, electrical signals in the brain, you'll start seeing some amount of, um, uh, of electrical activity. Okay, so first, first question is how fast do things happen? So for instance, uh, if you have human reaction time, so let's say, you know, buzzer goes off, you press the button, how long does that take? It takes about 300 milliseconds, about 0.3 seconds, the typical kind of reaction that one has. And, uh, you know, if you're really, really alert and young and so on, maybe it's a little bit shorter than that, but it's roughly 300 milliseconds, 0.3 seconds, or three tenths of a second. Um, and, and if you work out the speed at which uh, nerves, uh, nerve signals travel, what you realize is that 300 milliseconds corresponds to a lot of running around for, you know, I forget, I'd have to work that out, how it's, it's like uh, running, you know, hundreds of meters sort of inside your brain, running around trying to sort of figure out what to do in those 300 milliseconds. It's mostly not the time necessary to send the signal from your brain to your finger to press that button. It's mostly stuff happening in your brain. So one question is if you could pick up the information about what's happening in your brain more quickly than, than it really develops. So, so another thing to say is inside your brain, roughly, not quite the way it works, but, but if, it was, if our brain was more like an electrical machine, we might have low voltage electronics in our brains and then high voltage electronics to actually actuate something outside. It isn't quite the way it works but there's some phenomenon like that that causes, in order to develop the signal that you need to actually send it out on long distance nerves, it takes sort of more effort and more time. So then the question is what um, uh, uh, the, um, so, so you might be able to pick up uh, the information about, I'm going to press that button, uh, let's say after 100 milliseconds. So you'd save 200 milliseconds. Um, so in other words, if you were typing and you wanted to type faster, um, you would say, let's just pick up the signal in my premotor area before, before I get the whole sort of apparatus set up to actually tell my, you know, tell the muscle in my finger to move and so on and so on and so on. And actually there were experiments done, particularly in the 1960s, uh, uh, people for, who were flying uh, military planes and so on. There was the, you know, could one wire up the pilot so that the pilot would figure out what to do more quickly than they would do with human reaction times. Now, you know, there's sort of the question of, of, is that actually a good idea? Because, you know, it's like, oh, the pilot thought about firing a missile, but they weren't sure they were going to fire a missile. And, uh, you know, it picked it up in the pre-motor area and off went the missile, even though in another 200 milliseconds, they would have realized, oh, no, that's not a good idea. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it's for that particular application, it might not be the best thing. But um, in any case, so, so this, this question, can you, and I had long thought, I had long thought one of the advantages of, you know, uh, all one's hair falling out might be it'd be easier to stick electrodes on one's head and sort of type by pure thought. Turns out, well, it still hasn't been made to work of typing by pure thought. And also it turns out those electrodes, even though they make a bit of a mess, if you put them on your hair, they don't really cause trouble there. So in any case, so then the, 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 this is the long sort of answer to uh, 
let's say you could get these electrodes sort of in the brain and you could figure out uh, what that particular, um, uh, you know, what that particular uh, part of your brain does. I mean, we know when people do neurosurgery, for example, and they're trying to figure out, you know, exactly where to, uh, where to go in the brain, so to speak. They'll often excite a piece of the brain, figure out what effect that has on the person uh, to know, oh, that's the language area of the brain. We should avoid that area or whatever else. So, so it, it's, um, uh, so it's kind of known you can sort of, you can excite pieces of the brain, find out what the effect they have and kind of get an idea of how the brain is, is, uh, is laid out. And one can imagine using machine learning and that's been tried for, for some of these things like spinal cord um, uh, 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 mechanisms and so on um, to, to figure out you know, how, what is the mapping of how which nerve fiber goes with what thing. Um, and, uh, and some of it is fairly direct. I mean, like in the visual cortex, there's a fairly direct layout of the, the different pieces of your visual scene are fairly directly laid out as actual, at least in the first level of the visual cortex, as actual sort of uh, locations in the visual cortex. And so, so the, um, in any case, so, so the first thing is, can you figure out what the brain is, how the brain works, but figuring out sort of more abstract thoughts, a little bit more difficult, I think. Uh, you know, it's been a long running question is there a place in the brain where you think about, I don't know, Brussels sprouts or something, or you think about apples versus oranges? Long running question. And there are these experiments done with functional MRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging, um, where you go in an MRI scanner and um, uh, somebody says, think of an orange, think of an apple. And then one looks at uh, the, um, the activity of the brain um, uh, in different areas, and you try to map out if somebody thinks of an orange, where does it sort of light up in the brain? If somebody thinks of an apple, where does it light up in the brain? Those tend to be very, very coarse things. It's, it's very difficult to know. And it's very unlikely that, that there is a, just this point in the brain, this particular neuron that says, I'm the apple neuron. Another neuron that says, I'm the, I'm the orange neuron, so to speak. It's very unlikely that we encode information in that kind of spatially localized way. And in fact, it's become much clearer because we use artificial neural nets now for lots of kinds of machine learning things. We kind of know how those work and it just doesn't work that way. It's the, the knowledge of a concept is spread out across, across lots of different artificial neurons. And probably that's the way it works in human brains as well. The knowledge of a concept is some very complicated assembly of different kinds of um, uh, of, of connections between different nerve cells and not something where you can say, oh, that's the, you know, if I were only to, uh, to, um, to sort of excite that particular neuron in the brain, you'd think of an orange and that particular neuron, you'd think of an apple. It's, it's much more complicated than that. And that makes it much more difficult to imagine having an interface where you would say, because you, there might be in the concept of an orange, there might be excitation of a million neurons involved in the concept of an orange. And so to give you the thought of the concept of an orange, you'd have to be exciting across those, across those million neurons. And that's a much more difficult thing to do. Um, so, so I think the answer to, to when we will be able to get complicated thoughts transmitted to our brains that way, I think it's tough. I think that's gonna be difficult. Getting something like, I'm thinking of a letter um, and that you, know, you might learn because, because if you're doing the type by thought type thing, there's sort of two sides to that. There's one is, the system kind of, um, uh, you know, being able to recognize what's going on in your brain. The other is your brain knowing you being able to train yourself. Oh, if uh, and this is something that's that's done uh, for 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 people who aren't able to to communicate in other ways. They can start to train themselves to to have various kinds of brain activity that can be read out. That means something like yes or no or, or whatever else. Um, and uh, so I think, you know, between us learning how to do it, getting something like being able to pick out, uh, you know, letters on a keyboard, yeah, that's something one can imagine doing. Being able to get sort of the full, here's a web page, I'm going to ingest it directly into my brain, that seems really tough. I mean, I think the, 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 the setup of our, our eyes and our brains, and, and by the way, you might say, can I just take the, the thought pattern, you know, person A's thought pattern and inject it into person B? It's just not going to work because the detailed way that our, our brains, first of all, the way our brains are laid out, and second of all, the way we 
actually encode knowledge in our brains is completely different between different people. Uh, and that the reason for that is the encoding will depend on everything we learned in our lives. So unless two people had had the exact precise same experiences, they are not going to have encoded knowledge in the same way in their brains. And so just saying, here's this block of memory, here's this neuron number 3,214, had a, was encoded 0.7, and you're on this, encoded this, and so on. There won't be a mapping where you can just say, take the neuron map from one person and stick it in another person. That's not going to work. So the idea that, that there's sort of a, a transfer of thinking from person to person, not going to work. For AIs, um, if you had two absolutely identical AIs, you can do that kind of transfer. Um, and, and actually, in machine learning, it's really common to, uh, to use a method called transfer learning, which uses a, a sort of a layer of learning where you have learned sort of how something about how to learn, where one AI has learned something about how to learn or how to recognize features about something and be able to just use that as a, as a, as a preprocessor for another AI. But for us humans, um, that's, uh, you know, it's not gonna work that way. Um, I mean, for us humans, by the way, there are things that could happen. So one interesting thing that could happen is, uh, so right now, augmented reality hasn't really caught on. It's um, augmented reality is something where uh, a few sort of toy versions of it, but you know, in Pokemon Go or something, I suppose is a version of it, um, where, where it's like, you know, you might wear some special glasses where we're superimposed on your visual uh, field and what you're normally looking at is some, other stuff, maybe some annotation. Maybe it would be, you know, there's a picture of, uh, I don't know, the, um, you know, the camera that I'm looking at right now, and it might have a little arrow going to it that says camera. Okay, that's very helpful. I already knew that. But it might say, you know, it might have, if it was a person, it might say, oh, this is the name of the person if you forgot that. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a caption for your, for, for what you see in your visual field. So one of the things I can imagine happening is kind of a preprocessor for our, for, for our vision system that helps us with things. So it's so already, we have that a little bit. If you have a, like, like a night vision system in a car, um, you might have something where, where you'll see, well, it's seeing in the infrared, so it's able to see, you know, there's an animal that's just ran into the road and it's hot and so shows up as this big thing that is superimposed on your ordinary, uh, you know, on ordinarily what you're seeing through the windshield. Um, but we can imagine more elaborate versions of that we can imagine something where, for example, I don't know, the uh, well, for example, with infrared, it's like you know, if you, if you, there's a if there's a hot plate in front of you, and um, you know, we might not, we can't tell just by looking at it, is it hot, unless it's got some steaming thing on it or something. But normally, we couldn't tell if it was hot. But on the other hand, if we have a a camera uh, that is looking at it and has is sensitive to infrared, uh, which is uh, radiant heat. Um, then, then the camera will say, oh yeah, that's a hot thing. And, and it could superimpose something on our normal visual field showing this big sort of, uh, uh, you know, warning, warning, you know, that's a hot plate or something. So, so I can imagine things which are a little bit like this sort of transfer learning mechanism of, um, uh, of, of neural nets being used for humans, but pretty external to our brain. I don't think sort of having things that, that directly interface with our brain is, is all that likely to work. I unfortunately have to go fairly soon, and there's so many interesting questions here. This is um, uh, um, there's a question here. Is it true that only left-handed people are in their right mind, so to speak? I, I, I've said at various times that I happen to be left-handed. Um, you know, it's that's that's a slightly funny claim because it turns out, you know, there's left-handedness, there's left-footedness, there's Left-handedness for small motions, there's left-handedness for large motions. I'm a weird hybrid. I'm, I'm for small motions, like writing with a pen, I'm left-handed. But for bigger things, I tend to be more right-handed. So, so it's a weird hybrid case. I don't know what that means about the, how my brain is set up. It's probably really scrambled. Um, okay. Uh, okay, there's a question here from, uh, have we thought about adding augmented reality into things like Wolfram Alpha. Um, you know, it's funny. Uh, people were asking earlier about golden ages of technology. The idea of virtual reality, that is of being able to, you know, wear some goggles or something and have a 
a visual experience that is kind of like the visual experience you would have if you were just out there in, in the room. That's a thing that people sort of thought might be just around the corner since the late 1980s. Um, you know, what happened with sound? Back when I was a kid, you know, you could be listening to a concert for real, so to speak, or you could be playing a record um, and it was totally different. You know, the, the sound quality was totally different. But nowadays, you know, if you have your big fancy headphones and you've got digital sound and so on, you will hear a sound in your ears that is basically a perfect imitation of the sound you would hear anywhere else. And so, you know, for sound, we've pretty much managed to get it so that you can deliver digitally the perfect sound experience that is no different from sort of just being there, so to speak. The, um, for vision, we're not yet there. And, you know, we can kind of see why this is because for our ears, we have our auditory nerve has about 50,000 fibers in it. Um, and that's kind of the amount of information that's being transmitted to our brains from our ears. Our optic nerve has about 10 million fibers in it. Um, so there's a lot more information that's coming from our eyes than from our ears. So it, it's more data that you need in order to be able to accurately reproduce uh, a sort of a visual scene and an auditory scene. And we're not quite there yet. And you know, one of the biggest issues is we have a certain amount of peripheral vision um, to the sides. And when you're looking at a computer display, you're not getting that peripheral vision. Um, and you're also getting, you know, as you turn your head, there's a question of does the scene that you see, uh, you know, if, if it's just stuck on a computer screen, it behaves differently and so on and so on and so on. Um, and uh, uh, so, so there's been sort of this question about can you have these sort of head mounted displays that will be able to give you the appearance of being really in a, um, a visual environment. And that's been getting progressively better. But at different times in sort of technology history, it's been, we're just about to be there. And VR, virtual reality, is going to be really, really big. And that happened in the early 1990s, actually. It was, I remember the demos of, of VR. I remember playing a, 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 a ping pong, you know, a tennis type game in VR. I remember seeing, um, I'm not very good at that, but it's okay. I was, I was, uh, the, the, I was probably okay in VR, at least. Um, the... Uh, uh, and I remember sort of architectural walkthroughs, you know, this is the building we're going to build, walk through it in virtual reality to get a sense of what it will seem like. So, you know, it seemed like VR was just about to take off in the early 1990s and then it didn't take off. And, you know, I think the technology, the hardware wasn't quite good enough. And then a few years ago, it seemed like VR was just about to take off again. It was going to be really, really big. And it's still, again, you know, people use it and it's okay, but it hasn't really taken off. It hasn't really gotten to the point where people routinely use it. Um, and maybe it will, and there's a lot of issues about, you know, could you do video conferencing in VR? Could you, no, that's a little weird because you've got this thing attached to your head that is, um, uh, and you know, how does it see you? Well, you can do very weird things where you have sort of cameras inside the goggles looking at your eyes and, and they're sort of making up a fake version of what your face would look like if your face was actually exposed to the person at the other end and so on. There's all kinds of, funky ideas like that, um, that might or might not work. Um, but uh, uh, so, you know, I think it's one of these things where there are a lot of interesting applications for, particularly, I think, for augmented reality. I mean, it's kind of like one of these sort of fashion statement type things. It's like, you know, wearing glasses these days, I don't think is terribly cool. And, and you know, kids often want to get, you know, contact lenses or something because they don't want to wear glasses, even though they're very good for protecting your eyes, if nothing else. Um, the uh, uh, but, you know, by the time there's augmented reality, then suddenly glasses will be absolutely in fashion um, because you'll need them to, as a place to mount some augmented reality display thing. Maybe there'll be augmented reality contact lenses, but I really doubt it. And that would look so weird seeing, looking at somebody and seeing, you know, on their eye, so to speak, seeing some kind of display thing, as, which you'd probably be able to see if it was a, a larger display. Uh, maybe it'll look weird on glasses too, I'm not sure, but I think you can arrange the optics so that you wouldn't see that. All right, I think I have to run off because I have a, a completely different thing to do. Um, and uh, uh, this was fun for me, at least, as always, and uh, hope people found it interesting. And uh, I will plan to do this again next week. And I know we've got some... Um, uh, lots of questions that um, assembled here and I didn't get a chance to go through them.
and maybe we can do some of those next week. So thanks a lot.